Welcome to SIP episode 112. I'm wearing pink because we have a snippet on white Zinfandel you're going to want to listen to. And also we break it down with Ross Halleck from Halleck Vineyard, a person that planted a vineyard and their first commercially available Pinot Noir was ranked number one in the United States. SIP episode 112 begins now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Martin Cody, co-founder and your host this evening for Cellar Angels SIP Educational Tasting Series, and this is episode 112, uh, 112 episodes where we introduce to you just amazing limited production wineries from the Napa Sonoma wine region. Cellar Angels for the New Folks is a direct-to-consumer wine company. We specialize exclusively in the best small production wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. Many of the folks are drinking this white Zinfandel that uh, I have in my glass. Our guests have it in their glass. Several of you may have it in your glass. But for the new people, you may be asking yourself, well, wait, wait a second. How, how are these folks getting wine in advance? And the question is answered by going to the Cellar Angels website. So now I want to alert you to this because there's very few SIP episodes left this year. I almost just pushed the leave screen, leave button. That would be bad. So on the marketplace at the Cellar Angels website, you will see the SIP kit. It also lets you know that if you haven't registered for the SIP events, click register. You only have to click register once. Every Friday, an hour before showtime, you will get an email that says, hey, SIP starts in an hour. But here you can see the wines that are coming up. Also, we have the wines tonight right here. And on the Cellar Angels website, it's, it's pretty user intuitive. Just click the bottle. You'll be taken into a deeper explanation of the wine. You can see the price, incredible tasting notes, appearance, aromas, palette, food pairing, text sheet, everything you need to see is on the Cellar Angels website. Furthermore, and we get this question a lot as it relates to Wine Club, you can always go to my account and find out just about every single thing you need to know about everything you've ever done with Cellar Angels, what your current points are, how many signups you've referred. I actually stink at referring people. You can click on the refer a friend button. They sign up, you get points. By the way, wine club members get 10% off everything on the site. So you should definitely look into joining a wine club. If you haven't purchased a sip kit or oftentimes you ask, when was the last sip kit I ordered? Do I have enough wines? You have a whole schedule right down here that shows you when your last sip kit order was and how to replenish. So I apparently I haven't ordered a sip kit either. Mission Control, not happy with me. So uh, that is the Cellar Angels website. You should definitely be checking that out. You saw two wines tonight. That's actually called the Scotland. So Scotland is extremely busy. Izzy, good to see you again. Two weeks in a row. We are humbled and indebted. Uh, Doug, I know, has conflicts because he's a season ticket holder to about 23 different sports franchises. Uh, Jim B, B stands for Bocce, it's his middle name. Kathleen, nice to see you. So good to see everybody. And I know you're here for these two wines. Many people don't know the story of White Zinfandel, but we're going to get into it this evening. And we can think of no one better to get into it with than a person who decided to create a White Zinfandel entitled Not Your Mother's which is awesome. And we're also going to talk about a Pinot Noir, which is pretty darn special. So without further ado, I would like you to all join us in welcoming tonight's guests, Ross Halleck and Harris, because if it's Friday, SIP happens. So that is a fantastic decorative coaster from a friend of ours that I love. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross Halleck, Harris Minor, um, Halleck Vineyard. Cheers and welcome, gentlemen. Cheers and welcome to you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Eileen, for the uh, icon, iconography on, on the shamrock. I love it. So let's first talk, Ross, about White Zen. And if you can remember, I don't want to date you, your first experience with White Zinfandel. You know, actually, um, by the time White Zinfandel came into the market, I was already drinking those big Napa cabs. Really? Yes, I was. I, I, I chose wine as my drug of choice in my early 20s. And so we're talking, you know, in the 70s. And, and then, um, you know, I kind of evolved and, you know, uh, 
And um, of course, I remember ha having white Zinfandel. And it, the, the first time I had white Zinfandel was in Napa Valley. And it was the, with the director of marketing of Hubline, which is now Diageo, which owned Bullu Vineyard, which was one of those big Napa cabs. And we were, yep. um, I was a marketing professional and I was working and rebranding Bullu Vineyard. And they introduced me to White Zin. And, by, and, and I was like, like, like a gas that the director of marketing would introduce me to this, this, this beverage. And he looked at me and he goes, Ross, this is actually a serious wine. He said, I, he goes, I know that it is, is unconventional um, of me to say so, but this is, this is a real wine here. And from that point on, while I never gone for sweet wines, it's just never been except for a dessert wine now and again. Sure. Um, I, I, I always had a respect for it because I truly respected this gentleman. Um, he, he, um, and he just turned my head around about it. Well, it's interesting. My first experience with, and I would venture to say most guys first experience with white Zen was because they were trying to woo a woman or women, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> chicks well, dug white Zen. Yeah. It's a so, chick wine. Yeah. True. It is a chick wine. Now, mm -hmm. Harris Mm -hmm. Most people believe and understand that the wine was, you know, it's a Sutter home uh, production. It was in the seventies, uh, Bob Trinchero, but give us a little bit of a detail if you would please on, on what happened from what he was trying to accomplish and how this got problematic and how they made essentially lemonade out of lemons. Absolutely. So Bob Trinchero, uh, they took over Sutter Home, which was actually a defunct winery that closed during Prohibition. And they made a, a totally dry Rosé of Zinfandel originally in 1972. But in 1975, while Bob was trying to make this um, dry Rosé, they actually ended up with a stuck fermentation. Now, uh, stuck fermentation is when you know yeast mm -hmm. eat sugar, of course, and they produce alcohol, carbon dioxide, and um, heat, all of which will kill them in excess. When they start to die off, the yeast cells send signals to other cells saying, stop eating the alcohol, or sorry, stop eating the sugar, uh, you're killing us. And so you end up with a stuck fermentation. Now you can add more yeast, but if even one of those yeast cells that's selling out, uh, sending out those alarm signals survives, then you end up with a stuck fermentation. So instead the marketing team says, well, let's not keep filtering you know, several thousand gallons of rosé. It's meant to be a more affordable wine and that's very expensive. Let's see if we can come up with a different term. So they arrived at White Zinfandel, and it, even now I believe it's actually the number one selling uh, wine brand uh, in its category, which is kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> but of course, it was yeah. the most famous in the 1980s. It's it is astounding the success it has had, and I don't know many people that haven't had a Sutter Home White Zinfandel at some point in time. It is still, uh, I mean, it, the sales of this wine. Are, I wish we all had this challenge, it, are stratospheric. In 1981, they sold 25,000 cases of white Zinfandel. Six years later in 1987, they're at 1.5 million or something like that. And since I believe 1989, they've never had a year below 2 million cases in sales. I mean, it is absolutely incredible. And then Trinchero went on to make a couple other mistakes with uh, Menage a Trois, you know, and, and that wine, which is still the number one blend uh, wine sales wine. So they've got 50 different labels underneath Trinchero Wine Estates. It's not a bad family. The family's worth 2 billion. So there's people that frown upon white Zinfandel. It's led to a lot of success in philanthropy. So it's very, very good. Ross, why did you want to make a white Zin? Well, you know, we were um, making uh, Pinot Noir, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Gewürztraminer, and um, yeah, those 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 three varietals, and uh, and we were having some success, and we were building a wine club, and our mission is building community through wine, and so our wine club is really the most important part of our business. I, I would say eighty percent of our wines are sold to our wine club, and um, we were starting to get our cage rattled, and what I, by that I mean we were getting like emails and pings, and when is Halleck going to come out with a rosé? It's the new black, you know, we, we need to have a rosé from Halleck. And, you know, I really had never liked rosé. Uh, I had a, a consistent experience that every time I tasted a rosé, there was this bitterness on the back end. 
And um, it was just not very pleasing to me. And as popular as it was, you know, the thing when you're in the wine business, if you can't sell it, you have to drink it. So you better <laughs> like it. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, I, was, I resisted for uh, a, a couple of years. And then one of my wine winemaking colleagues said, you know, um, said, have you ever tried a Provencal rosé? And frankly, I hadn't. And so I went to the store and I got a, a Provencal rosé, um, which is, for those who don't know, is is a, a place in France, so uh, in Provence, and they, they actually grow grapes to make rosé. Um, in California, and uh, Trinchero is, is a good example of this, and, and most of the rosés in the United States are made in a sagne fashion. In other words, um, they're, they're um, making a red wine uh, and they want a little bit more oomph to that red wine. And so they bleed off some of the juice and blend it with um, other white wines. And that becomes the rosé, but the primary focus is making a red wine. And that, that process of bleeding is called sagne which in French means to bleed. And most of the rosés in the United States are made that way. And for reasons that nobody can explain, it adds a certain bitterness to the wine. And many people love that. I happen not to. And so um, we decided to um, listen to our wine club members and make a rosé, but we actually... Uh, sourced the fruit, the, the Zinfandel, with the intention of making a rosé. So it's called direct pre to press because we harvested the grapes, we crushed the grapes, we took off the skins and what was left, we fermented. And that is, it's a, it's, it's single vineyard and it is, uh, you know, 100% Zinfandel. Nothing else is added. Interesting. So, and I'll let people know we'll have Ross talk about this, his story in a second, but uh, as a teaser, I'm going to start our first poll question. And Jim, I saw that by the way, Jim B. And it's uh, our first poll question. So get your answers ready. Ross and Harris cannot answer. So when Ross started the vineyard and started the winery, a main goal of Halleck Vineyard is building and creating what? The most recognized Pinot Noir in the United States a national community through wine Awareness of single vineyard family wineries, exposure for Sonoma Coast wineries. So I'll give this a few minutes so I can wet my whistle. And for those of you interested in the World Series, the Phillies are playing the cheaters. I'll give this five four, three, two, one. So no one thought you were after to produce the most recognized Pinot Noir in the United States, but astute listeners would have just heard Ross exactly mention what their mission was. Ross, why don't you tell the folks what your mission is? Building community through wine. And what does community mean to you? Well, community in the context that we're uh, expressing is a three-legged stool. Um, the first leg is we invite people to our home to taste. So that that property behind you, Martin, your your very colorful and and heartfelt background is my family home that uh, I raised three sons in, and. Um, when people come to taste and Harris uh, leads them through an extraordinary experience, uh, we bring people to our home and, and it doesn't get more intimate than that to share wine in your home with people. The right. second leg of the stool is shared experience. And so some of the things that we do with, so with our wine club, which is the majority of our business, we do things. We've done wine and wildlife safaris to Kenya and South Africa. We've done culinary tours of Cuba. I've been invited to speak at the Iwani Hotel in Yosemite National Park six times. We invite our wine club members to that. 
Um, we'll be, we do events in New York. We've done events um, at Radio City Music Hall, uh, Del Frisco's, a host of uh, very fine establishments in New York. And we, we invite our wine club members to that. So uh, the second leg of building, uh, building community is shared experiences. And we always include our wine, of course. And the third, mm-hmm. the third leg of, of creating community is something that I am most moved by, gratified by, and inspired by, and that is philanthropy. And frankly, I never thought I would be able to say it. Um, there's a joke in the wine business. How do you make a small in the wine business? And the answer is, Martin? Start with a large one. Start with a large fortune. And uh, Jennifer and I did not. I mean, every we, we paid for every vine in, in that vineyard behind you. That was one acre vineyard um, with sweat. And uh, we, we sold for many years. Uh, but um, while I will never be one of those guys at these charity wine auctions raising their paddle, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, What we've done is we've created these experiences that money can't buy. I've shared some of them with you. We auction them off for the charities of our wine club members. And last year we eclipsed a million dollars. Wow, that's um, incredible. It is um, really, really touching to me. And uh, certainly what gets me up in the morning that I can plant a one acre vineyard in my backyard and raise three kids and struggle like year after year after year and also make the world a better place. And it's funny because it's literally what we talk about week in and week out in the newsletters. We share a lot of things with the Cellar Angels angels about our philanthropic mission. And we refer to our angels as heroes. Uh, And not, as I've said many, many times, not in the Marvel comic book heroes, but in the 2,000-year-old Stoic philosophy, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius heroes. They are protectors and defenders. And they are, in fact, heroes for the small winery because they are protecting and defending the small winery. And their purchases allow cellar angels to actually travel and to, Ross, to what your example, provide live tasting events that we auction off to then be able to raise more money for pretty impressive charities. So by helping and purchase wine through Cellar Angels, you're helping the small limited production winery like that Ross and Halleck Vineyard. You're helping the charity. It certainly beats going to the grocery store and, and grabbing a bottle off the shelf. And arguably the wine is better. Now, Ross talked about starting the vineyard and planting the vines behind me. So it's a perfect segue to how they got those vines. So Ross and Jennifer planted their first vineyard in 1993, I believe, with root stock from where? Cuttings they, quote, brought back from Burgundy in their suitcase. A supplier in the Yellow Pages from Kmart Garden Center and apparent grapevines, Costco's annual wine grower skid sale. Some pretty creative uh, choices there. We had a lot to drink this afternoon, Ross. <laughs> uh, and this probably was something that Harris found fascinating. And I, I think everyone loves the aspect of building community too, because it, it takes a, a village and um, we call it eudaimonia. You, you know, the cellar angels are eudaimonic people. They're good souls is the origin of eudaimonia. So helping people, it, it doesn't get old. I'm going to give this five more seconds, four. And by the way, both Harris and I are wearing pink shirts in honor of this pink wine. We are quite comfortable in our masculinity, so. Oh yeah. You know, people think rosé is for women or it's seasonal. Everybody can drink rosé. Three, two, one. So interestingly enough, no one chose Kmart's famous garden center. Uh, but two people, I'm not even certain Costco was around in 93, probably. Ross, what's the answer on where you got these vines planted behind me? Uh, from the yellow pages. <laughs> it still cracks me up to this day. Just like thumbing through, I'm looking for they went to nurseries. We, we, we went to nurseries and uh, 
you know, there's in, in of course in Sonoma County uh, in in the Yellow Pages back in the day, which was our Google. You know, they had ads, and um, we called all the big ads, and none of them had um, what we were looking for. And we got, you know, we found this guy named uh, Jim Caldwell who had a, a one line, um, just a single line uh, entry in the Yellow Pages, and uh, Jim. Uh, came over and uh, recommended our, the rootstock, and that, that we we chose all Dijon clones, and uh, he uh, was instrumental in uh, in crafting this little vineyard behind us. Now, did you know anything at all about rootstock, clone selection, planting, growing, viticulture? What? what, what? A- <laughs> what prompted you? That would be like me going, you know what? I think it's time to build a skyscraper. I couldn't construct a bridge. I, I, I mean, what prompted you to want to get into the wine business? Well, you know, Jennifer and I were, were dating when we first moved to, uh, to Sonoma County and moved, moved to that house together. We were sort of living in sin for the first couple of years until we got married. And uh, one of the things, one of, the, one of our, like, you know, uh, favorite dates, if you will, was going to the Napa Valley Wine Auction. And this was before we were totally priced out of it. But back right. in the day, you, you could go and, and, and spend four days in Napa Valley and, and go to the wine auction and, you know, hang out with the winemakers and and uh, taste their barrel selections. And we met the, we met the, the folks from. Um, oh, uh, now I'm, I'm blanking. Um, oh, so I'm, I'm having a senior moment, but we we, we met. Uh, some folks that that had uh, some Pinot Noir, and I was always Pinot Noir at that time was my favorite wine. I, I graduated from Cab to Pinot Noir, probably around 30, 31 years old, and um, we went to a barrel tasting and we tasted these Napa Valley Pinots that were from the Carneros area, so they weren't from the Valley Valley. They were they were south of um, of Napa, really. And um, we tasted these different barrels with these three Dijon clones, clones uh, 777, uh, 667, and 115. And we thought, God, this is great. Let's plant that. Not knowing that the fact that we were 30 miles away in an entirely different climate, entirely different soil, um, Entirely, entirely different elevation. elevation. Yeah, yeah, different elevation would have a tremendous impact on how on whether those grapes would even thrive, and let let alone make good wine. And we only had one acre, and the whole and the 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 the, the folly of choosing three clones to plant on one undulating acre was absolute silliness for anybody who was a real farmer. And we just didn't know. So we, we kind of made every mistake you could make. And and Harris, you are a student of history. I'm curious, how many wineries do you know that have planted three different clones of Pinot Noir and on their first commercially available bottle, it is ranked number one Pinot Noir in the country? I honestly can't think of any. You know, and and that does speak to you know this is the second vineyard in um, that was planted here. The first one was 1975, and this was was 1993. So you know Ross has mentioned what a risk it was, but nobody had planted grapes this far west or at this elevation either. It was a total shot in the dark, <laughs> um, and that kind of meteoric success doesn't happen, at least not that I know of. No, and I, I neither do I, and. It's such an interesting thing, Ross, because when we show people Google Earth, and I know Hans and Caitlin, you will in uh, in the replacement of your parents be chanting that in the chat soon. Uh, we will show people just how far west you are. And, and we talk about the Sonoma Coast AVA often, and it's you guys know it better than we do. Every winemaker we talk to talks about, you know, it's it's making wine on a, on a razor's edge. It, you are completely influenced by the Pacific. It's 11 miles away. You, The diurnal days are, are drastic. And diurnal is obviously the temperature variance between hot and cold, and it's upwards of 40 degrees. You have the fog. I mean, it's just such an unpredictable area to grow wine. And Ross, for you guys to plant 
three different varietals for clones that you loved and fell in love with from 17 miles away or so. How many times did you ask yourself, what on God's earth have we done? Oh, I never asked that. Um, and and we we just were we were like in and 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 I, I frankly and I think any entrepreneur would say this if, if if we knew all that we didn't know we would never have done it and so it we it was it was it was naive certainly and um I, I, the success I I um you know tongue in cheek I call the vine intervention um <laughs> we were we were um successful I I mean you say meteoric success. I mean, we had tremendous amount of recognition, and um, we we certainly became one of the um, uh, most respected and continue to be one of the most respected wineries here in Sonoma County. But meteoric success also has a connotation of financial success, and that's something that has um, really I wouldn't say entirely eluded us, but it's been very slow going. Because, right. you know, in order to have meteoric success, um, back to our original um, quip, you know, it takes a large fortune to make a small fortune. You know, if I if my name was Jackson or Gallo or Boisse, I would, you know, we would have billboards on Highway 101, which is the, the venue that goes from San Francisco into Sonoma County, all the way up and down the freeway saying number one, number one, number one. But since we don't have those resources, you know, people find out about us through the heroic efforts of you, Martin, people like you, um, who um, share by word of mouth. Yeah, it's it's so funny because it's it's such a challenge because you're pursuing something that you love with passion, reckless abandon, naivete and and I think you hit it on the head, Ross, when you talked about entrepreneurial spirit. And there, there was, you, you know, there's great many ups and downs, and that is the life of an entrepreneur. And you plateau and you realize, hey, we're doing great. We've got this figured out. Then a crash. And then, then you're on the kitchen floor going, oh, what are we going to do now? And then this, the, it's, so it's constant that, I mean, I think that is the constant thing of entrepreneurialism is that there's no, it's not linear, right? It looks like an EKG. It's up and down, it's up and down, it's up and down. Harris, I'm, I'm curious what drew you to Halleck? Well, hmm. you know, it's sort of a funny story. Years ago, I actually went to one of our vintner dinners um, at a very nice restaurant in San Francisco. And my uncle happens to be a sommelier. So the reason I went at all, I was freshly 21, had never drank wine before. You know, I always liked um, alcohol, but I drank craft beer and spirits like most of my generation does even, even now. And I never really got wine, you know? It just, I always thought, well... I could spend this amount on a bottle of bourbon and it's shelf stable. It's got 13 drinks versus five. But my <laughs> uncle said, come to this thing, see what it's like to have wine with food. And, uh, you know, I listened, listened to uh, Ross's speech. I tried and I remember begging my uncle, this might be after a few glasses of wine, somewhat emotionally to like, show me how to do this. I'd love to be a part of this. And years later, um, I decided to get in the wine business. I'm getting my MBA at Sonoma State in wine business right now. Uh, and, you know, Ross reconnected with my uncle um, and sent him my way and I applied and here I am. So happy. Oh, that's a, that's a awesome wine epiphany story. Awesome. 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 I'd be curious. And I think most of the seller angels audience would be curious too. How do you get five pours out of, of a bottle and we only get four? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a and, and I promised, I uh, promised everyone there'd be no math. So we'll skip that one. All right. We're going to turn cameras on in a little bit. Uh, but I do have one final poll question for the group. Uh, and Harris, thank you for sharing. I didn't mean to put you on a spot, but that's absolutely a, a great story. Uh, and it, it's, I love those wine epiphany stories. Go ahead. The, re the restaurant was one of San Francisco's most um, esteemed restaurants. It was called Campton Plays. And uh, it was an honor for me to be able to be invited to do a vintner dinner there. And um and I, I remain friends and, and colleagues with uh, with Harris's uh, uncle, and he has moved on to another establishment that uh, serves our wine. So we're um, we have a long history. That's great. 
Uh, we talk about California wines and California grapes. And I think it's interesting, Cellar Angels, how Ross talked about the clones and the clones that were important to him. 777-667-115. Those of you that know Kim Vance from Zoetic, those of you who know at least Asamont from Dot, you know, they're huge clonal geeks. Lise, I think, has a 777 clone tattooed on her arm. Uh, so when you can see how passionate people are about Pinot Noir specifically, but California grapes, I'm curious, wine lovers, what percent of all California grapes are actually for wine? 47%, 41%, 29% or 12%. Put your smartphones down. I, if I see one smartphone up in the air, let me see who else I haven't said hello to. Michael, I talked to you in the chat. Kathleen, hello. Another dollar. CJ, good. Got them all. Uh, by the way, next week, it's invite a friend to sip week. Five, four, three, two, one. Ross and Harris, any guesses? I would have thought it's the lowest. I think it's about 12%. Yeah, I would, I would say the 12%. Yeah. Interesting. It's the exact opposite. 47% of grapes in California are wine grapes. The other 53% wow. are That's crazy. Uh, table grapes and uh, raisins. Mm -hmm. Did not, uh, California raisins, right? So mm -hmm. uh, whoever the one person is, honor system i'd be curious who got that one correct in the chat very good uh mission control is going to turn on cameras by the way i forgot to tell you the winner of last week's pop quiz why seven mile distances between towns in napa and sonoma ross and harris do you know this i, I don't know if the restate the question if you look at if you go up route 29 if you go up route 101 most mm -hmm. of the towns are seven miles apart do you know oh, why? I didn't know that. No. Does it have something to do with the railroads? Close. Okay. The answer is it has to do with the old stage coaches, the horse-drawn coaches, because that would be about every seven miles they had to change the team of horses out so they would stop. And then that <laughs> became kind of a little bit of a town with a, you know, a, a store, a, a dry goods store and stuff like that. So it's funny too, because if you can do this on Google Earth and you map it from Petaluma to Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa to Healdsburg, Healdsburg to Guidesville, and you just keep going up, it's all seven miles. Same thing with Napa to Yountville, Yountville to St. Helena, St. Helena to Calistoga. It's it's eerie, and it has to do with the old stagecoaches. Super crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, I am going to pour some Pinot Noir in my glass, gentlemen. So, so um, my, Oh, wait, let we, me do this. Go ahead. We never really Ross. tasted this or talked about it. Well, that's that's exactly what I was just going to say. Let's do oh. this. Give me, <laughs> give me the aromas, flavors, and pairings of the white Zen. And uh, why is it called not your mother's? And and so and I'll where let you where, the where in the naming mom. where in the naming convention was was not your mama's, and you had to cross that one off and go with not your mother's. Karen gets so it. I'll handle the name. You, Harris, you, you, you do the flavors and the um, pairings. Okay. So this wine to me always has really great stone fruits, white nectarine, white peach, a touch of apricot, a touch of maraschino cherry. Um, it always reminds me of fruit cocktail in a way <laughs> because of all those stone fruits. There's some great white flowers on the nose. And then on the palate, I think most of those notes are confirmed. I also want to highlight, you know, there's almost a creamy, oily texture to the wine. That's because we make this in the Provençal method rather than the Signe. Signe has kind of a stuttered bitterness. The really smooth carry across the palate is the hallmark of the Provençal style, in my opinion. I um, mean, because of that slight touch of creaminess, that thickness, it goes beautifully with Thai food. That's one of our favorite pairings. The coconut in curries uh, reflects that creaminess. Ross loves it with Mexican food. Um, mm. I think you like chili rellenos, right? I still haven't tried yeah. that pairing. But my hands down favorite pairing for this wine is actually barbecue. Uh, you know, lighter really? of smoked chicken or pulled pork. And you don't want a big, heavy tomato based sauce. You want something more Carolina, more mustard or vinegar based. The tang and the coolness, the cream of the coleslaw pair beautifully with this wine. Oh, I like that. I like that idea a lot. 
And one of the um, what one of the pairings that we do at our our tasting is with a gorgonzola cheese. And and um, the reason I bring that up is because what's surprising about this wine is that as delicate as it is, it does incredibly well with strong flavors. And if you if you you know think about all the uh, pairings that Harris suggested, they're all big big flavors, and the wine it just just sings right through them. And why do you suppose that is? Why, why is it? Is it the backbone of the clone? Is it the the versatility of the fruit? Why is it? I think it's Zinfandel, truthfully. You know, Zinfandel is a classic barbecue wine. It's classic with bold flavors. And it's actually sort of a shame. You know, not a lot of people make a rosé of Zinfandel anymore. But if you think no. about it, think about the things you pair with Grenache, right? Grenache and Zinfandel are very similar in a lot of ways. They tend to be grown in similar environments. They have great fruit character and great acidity, both of which are what you're looking for in a rosé. So I think some of that character is reflected, some of the character of the red wine that is, is reflected when you make it in a rosé. But again, I think the Provencal style is a big reason why it adds a lot of texture and it absorbs the flavor, particularly with uh, the gorgonzola cheese. You know, the classic pairing for blue cheese is port, right? Port has right. sugar, one thing we're lacking, but otherwise it's a lot of fruit character and great body. And it absorbs um, the kind of harsher acid in the blue cheese. So I think even a rosé form, it's the nature of the grape. I love the aspect that you said barbecue so confidently because I think if you if you were to show you want to be badass with a bottle of white Zin and show up when someone's doing barbecue, they'd be like, "What are you doing?" Oh, and it's yeah. like, "Oh yeah, I, I will take this white Zin against whatever you're pairing with this barbecue." And it has that that body, that oomph, that power, that finesse to stand right up to those spices. I love that you said that. By the way, the winner of the quizzes was Jeff G and Jim Bocci. Jim B, but Jeff G is not present. So we actually, it's weird, this new rule, we take all of his points away that he's accumulated over the entire year and we give them to Jim B. So congratulations, Jim, you've doubled, Jan, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, the, the, look on Jan's, <laughs> the look on Jan's face scared me. Um, no, that's fine. Jim B gets some points because the winner has to be present to win. So that is an awesome pairing suggestion with regards to uh, the white Zin. Before we go on to the Pinot, I think the white Zin, just based on what you said, would also be a wonderful compliment to the Thanksgiving table. Fight me on that. Absolutely. Oh, I think it would absolutely work. I mean, truly, we never really drink wine on its own, but this is a wine that sometimes we drink with hors d'oeuvres uh, or even on its own because it's so versatile. But I also saw in the chat salmon or crab. Uh, you know, I Thank don't think we do salmon because we tend to pair our Pinot or a Chardonnay, but uh, we had a vintner dinner at Lamar in San Francisco with the most sensational crab ravioli. And this pairing is incredible. So anything with a touch of that sweetness, that seafood is going to work as well. But thanks All right. Me so <laughs> no, and, and, and it's funny because when you talked about the variety of flavors that it goes with, that made me think of the Thanksgiving table because there's just an explosion, right, of flavors on that table uh, from pies to potatoes to salads to turkey to ham to pork. I mean, it can be anything. And the versatility of this wine is, is fantastic. So I think it lends itself very well to that. As I do, look at Jim B. Jim gets announced that he's the winner of the pop quiz question, turns his camera on. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, so now we're going to go on to the Pinot Noir, the Hillside Cuvée, which is an interestingly named wine because the entire thing is a hillside. And I'm, I'm curious what clone this is and who, and Ross, I'd love you to walk me through a little bit about the 2018 Pinot Noir uh, Sonoma Coast Hillside Cuvée. Well, I not you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amalgam, you know, Cuvée uh, means, means, frankly, it means vat in, in French. And it has uh, become um, associated with a blend. And so when something says cuvee on it, uh, you know, including uh, you think mostly about sparkling wine or champagne uh, are cuvees. And oftentimes cuvees in the sparkling wine are, are actually blends of different vintages. Um, in this case, there it's 100 percent Pinot Noir and it's 100 percent 2018, but it's a selection of vineyards. And, you know, kind of, a, you know, a mishmash of, of clones. So it, it's not a it's not a very uh, telling question uh, or the answer isn't very telling uh, about what this wine tastes like. What is more telling is the fact that it is a Sonoma Coast. Interesting. 
it's almost like a Sonoma Coast field blend. You said a, a menage of yeah. Pinot Noir type of thing, which is fantastic. And mm -hmm. Harris, I'm going to put you on the hot seat for flavors, aromas, and pairings. Okay. Uh, well, this, you know, is our more Burgundian of the two uh, flagship Pinot Noirs we make. We make a Rush River Valley and a Sonoma Coast, which this one is. So really nice um, tart fruit, cranberry, and pomegranate. There's a very distinct uh, Burgundian note called animal or sauvage. That's the word the French use. Um, it's kind of a feral, almost musky scent. It, it's reminiscent of animals in some way. In California, we tend to call that barnyard. We rope it in with barnyard. Not really appropriate because they're different. This is more feral, more wild. And there's some really great white pepper and minerality um, on the nose as well. And that's, again, from those hillside soils. I think the palate reflects most of those with some great herbaceousness uh, and a touch of spice on the end. And the parents of this one, you know, Pinot Noir tends to be served with lighter dishes, but this can handle something a little more aggressive. Think your lamb, your game, uh, lean salmon on the grill, so it gets a little more oomph to it, a little more smoke, is sensational this wine. Of course, in our tastings, we pair it with triple cream, truffle brie. Um, truffles wow. and Pinot Noir thing, whenever they're together, particularly this, again, cooler climate style. And so the salmon on the grill that you're talking about, is it like soy glazed and seared a little no. bit? You no, but way. I've got one yes and one no. I mean, I, you know, you can do it that way. The I, I would say the Oregonians really championed uh, Pinot Noir and salmon, but their climate is very similar to ours. So right. the way they classically do it is you want a leaner salmon. That's the biggest thing. The reason you don't pair red wine with fish is because the fish fat uh, creates a tinniness, a metallic taste in the wine. It also can emphasize the fishy flavor of the fish fat. And so you want a lean salmon. You don't want your king salmon here. Save that for your Chardonnay. That's the biggest reason. Right. Yep. Perfect. And the reason uh, I, I said not a, not a, what did you say, a teriyaki glaze or whatever? Soy glaze. Soy glaze. Well, uh, soy glaze, maybe soy, but soy often um, is, uh, soy glaze is often accompanied with sugar. And, yeah. you know, I just don't think um, uh, a, a sweet, That's um, a good point glaze on on uh with with the dry wine are are very complimentary and i think uh i want to highlight a couple of things for the folks that uh i think this wine is delicious and by the way the some of us were at ross's place last year filming or was that this year it was last year last year holy cow we have to get we have to get out there again. Speed time. it's unbelievable it's uh jim b was there and sitting on this patio back here, overlooking the vineyard that I'm going to show you on Google Earth, it's one of those whiny, piffy moments where you sit back and pinch yourself and go, this doesn't suck. Uh, it's, it's really that good. That's a very technical term, Harris, I know. Uh, it's, it is a special, special place with special people, but you have the opportunity to actually get that because the angel bonus offer on this Pinot Noir, and it is Pinot Noir season, you've got a lot of celebrations coming up that are gonna require a fantastic Pinot Noir. But Ross has generally given this incentive that if you buy a case of this, you are sitting on that back patio with Ross for a private experience that includes a tasting with Ross Hallett. So uh, preferably when he's not traveling because you would like to have him there in person. And he's got a lot of travel coming up. So plan and purchase accordingly. I also like this item here with wood fired pizzas and Harris, you talked about earthy cheeses and stuff like that. So uh, wood fired pizzas, even with Italian sausage, it has some heat to it. This wine would be fine. Mm -hmm. Just a spectacular offering. Ross, biggest surprise since the first planting biggest surprise since the first planting first plant meaning when we first planted the vineyard yes the biggest surprise was winning number one pinot noir in the united states our first vintage that was like what it was like what how could that possibly be <laughs> it was like shocking from the yellow pages let your fingers do the walking mm. yeah we should literally have been only ross and i understand that reference maybe jim b <laughs> Uh, that's, that's dating, you're, you're, you're dating us <laughs> oh my gosh it's unbelievable how much that's dating the, the let me just actually show you a little bit about this property on google earth harris this is the segment everybody waits for 
the people yeah. actually just tune in literally at the bottom half of the half hour just so they can see Google Earth. Um, so I was a history guy, I love maps too. <laughs> the the component of mission control and I and Ivy and the team behind Seller Angels is is quite parallel to Ross's in that we want to build a community. We want to build a community of, of kindness, of, of experiences, of good souls, of heroes, of people wanting to, to wine better, if you will. And, and there is a component to a wine experience and a community around wine. And we've said it for 15 years, even when we owned the wine store back in Chicago, you know, wine brings people together and you have to be able to enjoy wine and it's a journey, not a destination. It, it really is, it, it describes wine is it, very aptly. But for Cellar Angels, this is the wine region that we focus. It, it is only Napa and Sonoma. Uh, to us, we're spoiled because we think it is arguably the greatest wine region in the world. Uh, geologists would agree with us because of the topography that is here, the climates that are here, the soils that are here. Uh, I say it week in and week out, week out, wherever I'm traveling around the country. When I explain to people, I said, you know, this is a Mediterranean climate. 3% of the earth has a Mediterranean climate. Uh, six, of the t six of the 12 soils are located in this region. And the Sonoma Coast has got a crazy amount of sandy loam, got a crazy amount of volcanic ash, got a crazy amount of rock. All of that is great draining. Uh, but the vineyard that Ross calls home is, is right here. And I'm going to pull back a second so you can see a little bit about the distance to the beach. And it's really not a beach, is it, Ross? You're not going to go over here and sunbathe for the most part. Well, you can walk along the beach. Um, you can walk there, along the beach. A lot of, you, have to, you have to hike down some cliffs to get there. And they have steps and, and paths down to the beach. Now, what's interesting, if we look at this and I show you the elevation profile of this 11 miles, it gives you an idea of, of just the freak nature of up and down and up and down and how rugged this terrain is. You're down, you're, you're and, at, at seven, go ahead. Oh, and we can see the water from our property. I mean, so we can see the ocean. You're at 84 feet, you're at 647 feet. Down, up, down, up, down, up. This is just all mountains. The fog comes in and just blankets this area. And it is crazy topography from a proximity of only 11 miles. Uh, it really does make a difference in the winemaking. And the fog is sometimes, it's, it's friend and foe. Is it not, Ross, from what I've heard? We don't know. You, you know, I know. mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of postulation about the impact of the fog, and um, and you know, the thing about fact and truth is that if enough people say it, it becomes fact. It's not necessarily the truth, and so isn't, you'll hear isn't many that the truth. So you'll hear many people say that the secret of you know our the extraordinary Pinot Noir that we have in on the Sonoma Coast is because of the fog. And then, you know, we've had vintages where we've lost the whole crop because of mold, because of the fog. So um, at the end of the day, it's, there are too many, you know, an infinite number of contributing factors that suggest that, 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 that do not allow us to make any gross um, generalizations about things being good or bad. Well, and it's it's interesting because you just hit upon a couple of points right there. The, the fog is challenging in a lot of scenarios because you you need great air circulation within the canopy. And in the fog, if it's always blanketing the vineyards, then you've got to go in and thin some of the canopy. And then that brings that requires more hand labor. And there's just so much to do. It is the Pacific Ocean and the region's air conditioner. Uh, it, it does cool and Pinot Noir loves these diurnal days where it's it's not going to be 95 at 8 p.m. It likes to get cooled down. Uh, this is Ross's house, excuse me, and this is where you taste on the back patio. And I, I put this in here because I think it's important that you see just the hill that you're on. So here's the elevation of that hill. When, when you're down here, you're at 519 feet. So when you move up 
to Ross's house, you've gone up essentially 150 feet or 15 stories in a very, very short period of time. Uh, so that gives you an idea, approximation of just how steep this precipice is that the vineyard sits on. And Ross, I don't know if I've ever asked you, what are the soils in the vineyard? Well, it's called Gold Ridge soil, which is a, which is a combination of clay and loam. Okay, well draining, not well draining. Um, depends on uh, the individual spot, but sort of medium draining. Okay, and obviously and the loam holds the, um, the the clay holds the water, and the loam drains the water, and so the, 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 there's a combination. It's sort of a, it's. A, you know, I, I think it's 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 kind of a, a magical combination because, you know, it holds enough water and drains enough water. And um, but again, I'm not going to um, go on a limb and suggest that, you know, that's any special secret or any special um, contributing factor to the quality of our fruit, uh, because there are so many. Give me the top three in your opinion, contributing factors to the quality of the fruit? I can't, and I won't. Harris? Harris is director of sales, he can. Yeah, I mean, I do think the climate in the sense of the fog, um, it keeps it very cool. Um, it also does promote rot sometimes because of the moisture in the air, so that's a concern. But it's definitely, I think it's the fog, the diurnals, which we've talked about before, I mean, actually the hillside location, I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, you can really taste the difference between valley fruit and um, hillside fruit. It, and that's true. Sonoma County, they spent a lot of time talking about that in Napa, especially because that's kind of one of the few uh, differences they have in their vineyards. You know, uh, Napa is one long valley. We have many different valleys and many different hillsides that we can place our vines on. But I think those right. are the top three for me. But I don't know. I'm just like Ross was saying, nobody knows. It's, it's, it's anybody's no, it's, opinion. And and Harris ha, has a, a tremendous intellect, and he's 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 he has very strong opinions, as do many. <laughs> and I would take issue with anybody's opinion, and not just because Harris and I work so closely together. But I think that that we we sit on panels all the time, and people talk with tremendous confidence about what they think makes this region special. And, you know, my, my retort always is, you know, we're human. We can't possibly know. And, you know, as soon as I think, I think it's important in winemaking as with any endeavor, but especially with an endeavor that involves engaging with the earth, that um, humility is the, is, it has to be the operative. Um, you know, we, we are, we are um, shepherding these grapes from earth to glass we're doing our best. We're, there, there's a lot of faith involved. There's a lot of guesswork involved. And at the end of the day, when it works, we really can't take credit for it. It's um, it's it's bigger than we are. And and I and I will, you know, um, you know, if, if if I'm confident about anything, it's I'm confident about not knowing. <laughs> right about not being confident. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wanted to show folks a little bit about where we are, where you are. So we talk AVAs all the time, and this get, this is a great map that gives you kind of a, a peek at just the complexity of AVAs. So here we've got the Sonoma Coast AVA, but the Sonoma Coast AVA is big, and, and it goes all the way along the coast, and tucked into it is Fort Ross Seaview, another, you know, winemaking area on the knife edge. Uh, then you've got an Occidental, Green Valley, Russian River, which we talked about earlier from his Infidel source for this. But you're what in this? Are you like right in the R of Freestone? Yeah, uh, like in that little, yeah, right in the R, maybe a little bit. Yeah, right in the R of Freestone. That's where we are. I mean, it's it's impressive. And the topography is amazing. It is absolutely incredible. And for those of you that are golfers, you know, driving on some of these roads, some of these roads are, are about as big as a cart path. It's incredible. You, you think you're lost and you shouldn't be on the road. Uh, speaking of cart paths and roads and driving, Ross, how do people come taste with you? Um, they use uh, Google. 
<laughs> or they they use uh, Google Maps or or um, or Apple Maps, and they and and we've been very careful, in fact, um, and and place the dot on Google Maps right at the entrance to our property, so it will take you right to our front door. And uh, uh, so, but in order to come, you have to make an appointment. So we do not offer open tasting. And uh, to your point earlier, um, the tastings are sit down. Uh, we 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 include pairings with each of those with, with those tastings. We taste seven or eight wines, and each of them are paired with local and organic um, uh, delicacies or delectables. I would say from our neighborhood. And Harris does most of the of the uh, the leadership of those tastings, and because he brings such a a, a, a wealth of of historical knowledge, um, I have to say that when I sit and listen to Harris's Harris's uh, presentations, I learn something every time. Yeah, and by the way, it's funny, Harris. You speaking this evening, you don't know Mission Control and I, the co-founder. Uh, I mean, our background, we owned a bricks and mortar wine store in Chicago for seven years. We've tasted thousands upon thousands of wines, and it's always so rewarding and fun to hear someone who has a passion for wine describe wine. And you, my friend, uh, are very articulate and have that passion, and it is just rewarding to us to hear you describe it. So congratulations on on being so moved to pursue a career in wine. It is, uh, you know, much better than beer. <laughs> well, thank you. And, you know, part of the tasting notes is, I think, uh, expanding on Ross's point, which is, you know, it's just what I perceive and it's what the grapes are trying to tell us. The, the reason that sommelier study for years is not to make these things up. It's a way to interpret the language of the grapes of earth, you know, maybe even of a higher power. It depends on how you want to characterize it. But, you know, yep. what else life is about except pursuing that kind of passion? Completely agree. And I love, again, Ross, your desire from day one to build a community. And it does take a community. Earlier this week, I was in Washington, D.C. for a conference for three days. And I walked to my hotel every day. It's 1.7 miles, not a big deal. But I was in Georgetown and walking. And literally within the span of four blocks, I got to pass a synagogue, the National Cathedral, a temple that had something on it that said uh, abortion rights or Jewish rights, a Black Lives Matter sign, a Ukraine flag sign. And then I walked into a 31 year German establishment for Oktoberfest and was greeted by an Asian waitress on her first night mm -hmm. within three blocks. So this is a melting pot. Wine brings this community together and great wine brings great people together. I'd like to raise a glass to Harris and Ross this evening for sharing with us really the passion and, and the vision behind this and also uh, everything that it's taken to get this far. So cheers to both of you. And, and Ross, by the way, had to call a very, very special audible and fly from San Francisco down to Los Angeles at the last minute. So he's doing this from a hotel room. <laughs> Incredible. So cheers to you both for that. Well, thank you for having us, really. Thank you. Our pleasure. And Angels, you're in for a treat. For those of you that have always been curious about resveratrol and the health impacts of red wine, wow, have we got a guest for you next Friday. With us is going to be Jeff Bost. He's a medical professional that is on the UPMC Medical Advisory Board. He's on the Medical Advisory Board for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he has gotten something about 70 some odd articles on red wine health benefits. We're going to go deep into how much wine do I have to drink to be healthy? That'll be a question. <laughs> I'll ask him. Might, might be framed differently, uh, but it is going to be the health benefits of wine because there's hundreds of articles out there on this and it will be SIP episode 113 coming to you live. So bring a friend to SIP next week. As we always say, be good to one another, raise a glass, drink a bottle of the good stuff and stay safe. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. Ross and Harris, thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, guys.